delighted to be with you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Glenn asked me to share a little bit about my story and how I came to think of the practice of social justice as, as a spiritual discipline and as central to the way of Jesus. And so I want to talk to you a bit about that. I begin with a little thought experiment. Imagine that a race of aliens were to visit our planet tasked with the job of describing evangelical Christians in North America. That strange tribe of which we're all members. Uh, the task is to investigate what is it that differentiates evangelical North American Christians from other folks, from other denizens of the North American scene? What is it that is different about the way we live, the, the things we talk about, the things we hold dear, the way of life we pursue? I think they might conclude that something like the following differentiates evangelicals from their neighbors, by and large. Evangelicals love the Bible. <clears throat> they love to read and talk about it and sometimes argue about it. I know I go in for that. Non-evangelicals, well, they like the Bible too many, but uh, don't by and large go in for uh, this sort of thing nearly as much. Evangelicals think it of the utmost importance to believe the right things about Jesus because thereby one goes to heaven when one dies. They spend considerable time and effort trying to convince others to believe the right things about Jesus so that they might go to heaven when they die. Non-evangelicals don't spend nearly so much time and effort at this. Evangelicals think of their religious lives as <clears throat> centering around weekly religious services at a local church building, regular attendance at which is thought to be extremely important. The most important things about these services is that there be engaging teaching, sermons, and worship music that stirs the religious affections. Non-evangelicals aren't so much concerned about these things. Evangelicals spend a lot of their money on these church buildings and various programs and services housed in these buildings aimed at meeting the religious needs of their families, needs for education, counseling, entertainment, and worship. About 90% of the money that evangelicals donate goes toward these programs and services. <clears throat> Evangelicals donate more to their churches than their non-evangelical Christian and secular peers. Among non-evangelical Christians, giving to churches in the United States is about 2.7% of annual income. Among evangelicals, it's about 4%. Among the non-religious, it's about 0.7%. Evangelicals really don't want gay people to get married. They they spend considerable time worrying about this and more generally about the sexual mores prevalent in the wider society. Now, no doubt the alien investigators would notice other differences, but these, I think, would be some main ones. Commitment to regular Bible reading, church attendance focused on preaching and worship, Commitment of considerable financial resources to church buildings, programs, and services aimed at meeting religious needs of the families who attend them. Deep concern about the sexual mores of the wider society. Now, I'm not criticizing any of this. Um, uh, I just point out that these would be among the main differences our alien investigators would notice between evangelicals and their neighbors. Much else, I think, though, would look the same about our lives. The houses we live in, the cars we drive, what we do with our spare time, the careers we pursue, what we do with our money, the gadgets we buy, the shopping we do, the clothes we wear, the people we associate with, 
All this would be about the same as our non-evangelical, and for that matter, our non-Christian peers. Now, most of this would be true of me for most of my adult life. For more than 20 years, I have thought of myself as a serious evangelical Christian, utterly committed in mind and heart to Christ and his cause in the world. And yet, were our alien investigators to observe much of my adult life, the only real differences they'd have seen in my life as compared to my non-Christian neighbors would be the ones I listed above, a few others, but not many. In November of 2009, I had about a month-long experience that has come to me as a call to profound repentance. I'm open to there being other explanations of this experience. <clears throat> it might have been a midlife crisis, that not uncommon experience in midlife of emotional dislocation and uncertainty about the course one's life has taken. It may have been that. But it came to me as a powerful, life-shaking experience of the Lord. A vivid call from him, one I'm still trying to figure out how to live into. It was a several week long experience of feeling very vividly the presence of God and feeling very vividly his pain for the broken of the world. The poor, the vulnerable, the marginalized, the suffering, the downtrodden. The gospels came alive for me in an utterly new way. I found myself deeply shaken by the gospel depictions of Jesus touching the leper, healing him, and the process himself becoming unclean and an outcast. <clears throat> I watched him speak tender words of mercy and healing to the long marginalized peasant woman who, because she had been hemorrhaging for years, had been ritually unclean and excluded from society. I watched him feel compassion for the hungry and then feed them and teach his followers to do the same, to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, shelter the homeless. I watched him practice the deepest kind of community one could practice in that culture, <clears throat> table fellowship with the marginalized of his day and to urge his followers to do the same. I watched him at personal risk to his safety heal the man with the withered hand on the Sabbath because doing good to the hurting was more important than punctilious observance of religious duty. <clears throat> I watched him rebuke the religious leadership of his day for devouring widows' houses and for neglecting the weightier matters of justice and mercy and stage a protest action at the temple rebuking the temple leadership with the same language Jeremiah used to rebuke the temple leadership of his day for neglecting the poor, the widow, the orphan, and the immigrant. All of this shook me to the core. Throughout, I experienced vividly, God saying to me, what about these? What about these I care so much about? For much of the month I wept. And this is what struck me so powerfully. These teachings and practices of Jesus recorded in the Gospels, this radical self-giving love for the broken, the marginalized, the outcast, these crazy teachings of the Sermon on the Mount, <clears throat> and elsewhere to love enemies, not store up wealth, but give it away to the poor, to invite the marginalized into our homes, to associate with the lowly, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, shelter the homeless. All of this is for us. We are invited into this. Our Heavenly Father, our Abba, is calling to us with a love whose sweetness and tenderness is beyond comprehension. 
calling us into the way of Jesus to live out Jesus' radical countercultural way to give our lives to it, all our energies, our careers, our financial security, our worldly status, to this radical way of love on display in the pages of the Gospels. And he is doing this because he loves us and wants to fill us with the joy of Jesus, the joy of his way and the shalom it gives rise to, the joy of entering into that shalom and ministering it to the tears and cries of human suffering. But we miss this call. We miss it. He speaks gently to us of its goodness, its power, its beauty, its sweetness, but we miss it. We're blind to it, you see. We humans are such social animals, such social creatures. We unconsciously, unintentionally imbibe the way of looking at the world prevalent in the cultures we inhabit. We're like the proverbial frog who doesn't realize he's slowly being boiled alive because the water is heated so gradually. We slowly take on the values of the world around us without realizing it until soon we've been boiled alive in them. Until soon our lives, our outlook, our values become practically indiscernible from the world around us. And worse, we're unable to see that we're in this predicament. We say we love Jesus and he's our Lord, but our lives look no different than anyone else's. This has happened to us with Jesus' teachings. We hear them talked about in sermons, in classes. We read them over and over again, but we don't hear them as calling us to radical conversion, radical countercultural discipleship unto Jesus and his way because we're totally immersed in a way of life, a way of being we've inherited from our culture, a way that is so utterly different than the way of Jesus that we've become unable to hear his teaching. <clears throat> now let me talk a little about that way. Um, it's so beautiful, so powerful, so earth-shaking. I don't have time to say too much but I'll make a couple small points. First, brothers and sisters, the kingdom of God is here, and it's yours for the taking. This message is what the gospel writers called the gospel, the good news. A little bit of background about what Jesus meant by this. Remember that Jesus was a devout first century Jew steeped in the writings of the Hebrew prophets who taught that one day God will be king. He will rule. And when that day comes, or in the language of first century Judaism, when the kingdom of God comes, some deeply good things will happen. There will at long last be peace. There will be peace. No more war, hatred, or strife. And there will be justice in which all have enough, including the powerless, the vulnerable, the marginalized. And there will be healing. God will wipe away tears of suffering from all eyes. And there will be forgiveness. God will forgive us of our sins, though they are many, and teach us to forgive one another of our sins. And there will be joy. We will delight in each other, in our lives together, in our work, in the glories of creation. The prophets had a word for all of this, shalom, shalom. When God's kingdom comes, they said there will be shalom. Now first century Jews were waiting for this kingdom and into this context, Jesus spoke a radical word. He said, it's here, it's starting. It can be tasted and experienced now. Not quite in the way Jesus' contemporaries expected, one has to say. 
the thought in first century Judaism was that the arrival of the kingdom of God would be a cataclysmic earth shattering event in which God in one fell swoop would defeat evil and set up a new world order of peace, justice, healing, joy, etc. But not so, said Jesus. It's not going to work like that. The arrival of the kingdom, he said, is more like mustard, a weed that sneaks into your garden slowly and quietly, starting off as a tiny little seed, infiltrating little by little. But don't underestimate the power and goodness of the mustard seed kingdom, said Jesus. For though it is now small in our midst, and we enjoy but foretastes of its blessings of peace, justice, healing, forgiveness, and joy, the foretastes of these things are good, deeply precious, like a pearl you might find, said Jesus, which is so valuable, you'd be willing to sell all that you possess to lay hold of this pearl. His radical message then was and is that the shalom prophesied by the prophets, the rule of God with its peace, justice, healing, joy, forgiveness, and divine presence is breaking in, it's starting. It can be tasted now and it is good, deeply good, and available to anyone who would put their faith in Jesus, where this means to trust him, abide in him, and follow him into his teachings and practices. Learning from him how to live in this shalom and minister it to others. The shalom of God's rule is here, and it is good and sweet, so deeply good, so deeply sweet, it's like a pearl of great price you'd be willing to sell all that you have to lay hold of. Peace, justice, healing, joy, forgiveness, God's presence, the blessings of shalom. These are here, they can be laid hold of, ministered to others, entered into, and they're good. But when they get hold of you, they will turn your lives upside down. When they get hold of you, your life won't look anything at all like the lives of most of your neighbors. Radical things will happen. There's so much to say about this, um, but I've got time just to focus on one part of it, and that is justice. When the shalom of the rule of God floods into you and begins to overspill to those around you, you will find yourself powerfully drawn into the practice of justice. Now justice is the state of a community when all in that community, not just those rich or clever enough to insist on it, are included in the goods necessary for shalom. Our Abba's heart breaks for the marginalized, the excluded, the downtrodden, the hungry, the thirsty, the jobless, the lonely, those excluded from shalom. Indeed, there's evidence in Jesus and the prophets that this makes God deeply angry. Jesus practiced justice and taught his followers to do the same. This took three primary forms. First, he shared the goods of shalom with those excluded from those goods, those on the margins, and taught his followers to do the same. He fed the hungry. He healed the sick of diseases that made them religiously impure and kept them on the margins of society. He touched them, healed them, and drew them back into community. He urged his followers to likewise bring healing to the sick to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, shelter the homeless, to invite the poor, the marginalized, into their homes. He said, don't store up treasure on earth, but sell your possessions to care for the poor. Woe to the rich, he said. Woe to those who dress in purple and fine luxury whilst there are starving men, women, and children on our doorsteps. Don't you see, Jesus is saying to us, 
These precious brothers and sisters are beloved by our Abba. Sell your possessions to free up money to care for these beloved ones, Jesus said. Note that he didn't call his disciples to a tithe. He taught them to sell all their stuff in care of the suffering. No one can be his disciple, he said, unless he gives up all his possessions. His message to the rich young ruler was the same as his, messages to, his, as his message to his disciples. Give up everything in service of those who suffer, in service of radical love. That's the first part of justice, or at any rate, the justice of Jesus' is shalom. Radical sharing with those on the margins. Not living in luxury and excess wealth whilst others starve, but giving it away. Brothers and sisters, this is for us. Radical sharing is for us. One in five children in the U.S. struggles with regular hunger. We dare not live in luxury whilst these hungry children are at our doorsteps. Sell your stuff. Live as simply as you can manage. Give away your excess to the brother or sister in need. Second, Jesus practiced community with those on the margins. Among the most profound ways of expressing community and solidarity with someone in the first century Mediterranean world was to practice table fellowship with him or her, to eat together. Jesus ate with those on the margins, which deeply scandalized his contemporaries. He taught his followers to do the same. When you give a banquet, he said, don't invite your rich friends and relatives. Invite the poor, those on the margins. This is the second part of the justice of Jesus' shalom. Community, friendship, sharing life with those on the margins. This isn't, by the way, something we do just for their good. Jesus taught us to practice community with those on the margins for our good. He knew of our powerful tendency to idolize wealth, status, power, comfort, to be arrogantly cold-hearted, attempting to live independently of God and others. He knew this about us. Sharing life with those in struggle helps heal us of these things. Folks in struggle... Folks depending on God for their next meal know what dependence on God really looks like. By not just sharing our stuff, but our lives with them, we learn much about what dependence on God feels like, about compassion, and about what matters in life. Brothers and sisters, this is for us. Practice friendship, shared life with those in struggle. Hang out with the houseless, End their houselessness by inviting them into your homes. Befriend them. Learn from them. Hang out with the profoundly lonely in nursing homes. Spend weekly time at someone's bedside. Hang out in the Santa Ana Civic Center on Saturdays, befriending people there. Befriend those in struggle. And third, Jesus advocated for those in struggle. He spoke truth to power that would oppress and marginalize. Read carefully Mark's description of Jesus' cleansing of the temple and his public criticism of the temple leadership. He was accusing the temple leadership of devouring widows' houses, of mistreating the poor by running an exploitative system of tithes and taxes that further impoverished an already impoverished peasant class. Read carefully the story of Jesus' healing of the man with the withered hand in the synagogue on the Sabbath. This was prophetic protest. He didn't have to heal on that day, in that place. He could have done it in a different day in secret. But he very publicly breaks a religious rule in an act of prophetic protest against a system whose effect was oppression and human suffering. This speaking of truth to power was what got Jesus crucified. And his call to the disciples to take up their cross and follow him was a clear teaching to the effect that they were to do the same speaking of truth to power, even if it meant persecution, even if it meant death. 
This is the third part of the justice of Jesus' shalom, advocacy for those on the margins, speaking truth to power that oppresses. Brothers and sisters, this is for us. Advocate for the poor. Advocate for the undocumented immigrants living in fear, suffering the ravages of separation from their families as they endure years of detainment in immigration prisons, suffering abuse from employers, poverty wages, and more. Abdicate for these brothers and sisters. Go to your congressman or your congresswoman's office and let them know of your heart for these brothers and sisters in struggle. Write letters. Participate in protests. Choose a profession that enables you to be a voice for the voiceless. Advocate for the vulnerable. These then are the three features of the justice Jesus taught in practice. Radical sharing with the vulnerable, community, friendship with those on the margins, and advocacy for the, pre the oppressed. You see, what Jesus showed us is that we are our brother's and sister's keeper. We are. We are responsible for our neighbors. When they suffer want, we are responsible to come alongside and draw them into the blessings of shalom, not just for their good, but for ours. And who are our neighbors that we're thus responsible for? Well, doesn't the parable of the Good Samaritan make it painfully clear? My neighbor is anyone in need and in reach of my love. <clears throat> Ethnic, racial, class, religious, national boundaries don't matter in the least. My neighbor is anyone in need and reach of my love. I'm responsible for these. Such is the justice of the shalom of Jesus. Now, there's so much more to say, but I'm out of time. The shalom of the kingdom is here, my brothers and sisters. It's here for the taking. Enter in. Taste of its peace, justice, healing, forgiveness, joy, and the sweet presence of our Abba. Spend time in the Gospels. Abide there with Jesus and watch. Watch what he does. Imitate him. Do the things he said to do. You won't be able to do it alone. You'll need a close-knit group of brothers and sisters to help you. But it'll be good, so good. It will turn your lives upside down. I pray that for you. I pray that the Lord will turn your lives upside down, that he'll draw you into radical, utterly countercultural lives of love. May he fill us more and more with his shalom, and may you be blessed as the semester comes to an end. God bless you all. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.